This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so this is the last in our series, ended up being, I believe, a five-part series on anti-Semitism, where last week we dealt with one of the three that are presented as the main causes of anti-Semitism, not what it's attributed to, not the excuses that are given, but the underlying issues at play in both our physical, political, and more, most importantly, spiritual world. Last week, we dealt with the idea of Masa Avot, Simen Lebanim, that which happened to the patriarchs, the matriarchs, that unfolds as it works its way down to us, the descendants, and our connection to God, morality, that which we brought to the world that has earned us their eternal scorn. And to the point, uh, as I, I had discussion this week with somebody on this topic, that according to much of the, go of the, of the gospels of Christianity, so we are uh, the devil's partners, we are right, for uh, not accepting their view and having our pure, unadulterated view of, of God and morality as it comes to the world. Today, we're going to be discussing two other main causes, causes and then the remedy, that which we, can, which we can do, and that which we'll have to wait for the ultimate uh, redemption for it to come about in its, uh, to reach full fruition. Okay, so a second approach is section two, as you have in your notes, that it is a tool for ensuring that Jews carry out their mission. In other words, this is a tool of God's to ensure that we stay who we are, that we don't just fade away. You know, they, they talk about New York as the melting pot. Well, in a melting pot, every, every component loses its identity. And we can't be part of a melting pot. And um, when we try, that is when the anti-Semitism raises its head. All right, a famous quote, I believe uh, attributed to Rav Chaim of Velazhin. If the Jew doesn't make Kiddush, the Gentile makes Havdalah. Of course, a play on words, Kiddush begins Shabbos, Havdalah ends Shabbos. But on a deeper understanding, Kiddush is consecration holiness. If the Jew doesn't separate himself in a holy manner and tries to just blend in, then the Gentiles make that Havdalah. They make that separation. Let's go to source number 17, the remnant of Israel, again from Rav Meiselman. Laban typifies a specific form of anti-Semitism, where the Jews live in proximity to their neighbors in the exile. Initially, they are invited to become one with them, shed all differences. Gradually, some Jews become convinced that under such hospitable circumstances, there is no longer a necessity to maintain religious practices that separate them from their neighbors. Why should we do things that will make us different? The lesson from Lavan is that the Jew must remember that his hospitality is not permanent. In each land, circumstances will arise that will turn the Gentiles' love and hospitality to hatred and persecution. However, while this hatred is permanent, Hashkacha, the divine providence of history, determines when it emerges. You know, a, a very beautiful thing that I have, often as I'm walking to shul on Shabbos, I pass by a number of my neighbors who are Muslim, and they say to me, pray for us. And I say, I'll pray for all of us, and you pray for all of us. All right? It's fine to be different. It's fine to, we need to be who we are, and at the same time have this, this 
compatibility, this warm congeniality with all those who are around us. And I often speak about the, the, the opportunity. Responsibility has sometimes a, a negative uh, overtone, but the, the opportunity that I have, that I walk around with my keeper all the time, and that I can be a good ambassador, that I am different. I am one of the few people in the in the shul in the in, in, in the in the store wearing a kippah. So I have my individuality and make sure that I that I use that opportunity to be a good ambassador. You know, Poland in Hebrew we say polim. And if you break that down, it becomes two words, po lin. Here we will rest. The Jews were in Poland for close to 900 years and thought, oh, this is where we will truly settle. And uh, we all know what happened to the, to the millions of Jews who were in Poland. The Nitziv, that Rav Meisman was quoting, or was was speaking, uh, was expanding, also goes to our Haggadah that we spoke about. We started last week, we mentioned the Haggadah. Shebechol dovador, ondim aleinu lekaloteinu. In every generation they try to destroy us and Hashem saves us from their hand. And Haggadah tells us, Hashem told Abraham, they'll be strangers in the land, they'll be enslaved, persecuted. I will judge those people they will go out with great wealth. And this has enabled us and our forefathers to survive. That not just one stood up against us, but rather in every generation, they stand up against us and Hashem saves us. Second paragraph. Let me keep scrolling down. If I forget, please remind me. But what does it mean to say that the secret of Jewish survival is paradoxically the desire to destroy the Jewish people? We, understand, we must understand how we are supposed to relate to the exile. Hashem told Avraham, Ger yihyeh zaracha, which means your descendants will be strangers. Our national destiny is to dwell among the nations, but to remain unique and distinct. Not necessarily distant, but distinct. Accordingly, the Haggadah highlights that Jacob Vayagar Sham, and he sojourned there. He was not planning on settling in there, rather as a guest, as a stranger, not due to a lack of hospitality on the part of Pharaoh, Egyptian people. They were free to become citizens. It was Jacob's choice to remain a stranger. His goal was that he and his children would remain separate. And that's what Moshe Gay said to Jewish people, and Israel shall dwell securely separate in accord with the vision of Jacob. Yosef also insisted, the next paragraph, that his brethren dwell separately in Goshen. During his lifetime, he did not allow them to leave. And they dwelt in harmony with the Egyptians because we were distinct and separate. After his death, we were told, and the land was filled with them. The lines of demarcation were eroded. Indeed, the message records that as they spread through Egypt, their stated goal was to be as the Egyptians. Cessation of circumcision, that physically defining aspect of the covenant. The response, the last paragraph, to the Jews' desire to assimilate the measure tells us was a growing hatred of them by the Egyptians. The process of intermingling that result in an attempt to adopt non-Jewish customs finally in a rejection of God's covenant is what ultimately caused Egyptian anti-Semitism. That's what kept us who we are and did not allow us to just fade away. And number 19, If the Jews do not separate themselves to fill their unique task, they'll be separated in far harsher ways. 
if the Jew doesn't make Kiddush, the Gentile makes Havdalah, right? We have Tisha B'Av coming up on July 18th. And Saturday night, we read, that Saturday night, we read Megillat Eicha. We read the Book of Lamentations. Eicha Yashva Badad. Eicha, how has it come about? Yashva Badad. That we're sitting, sitting all by ourselves. Rabbah, in the name of Nach of Yochanan said, I, Hashem, said that they should dwell securely according to the vision of Yaakov, the verse above. Now they have rejected this, the city shall dwell desolate. The above Talmudic statement informs us that as a consequence of their rejection of this mission, the nations of the world have forced them to dwell apart. In this way, Israel is saved from herself. That's the content of Bilam's, pro Bilam's prophecy. We discussed this actually this past Shabbos. They are a nation that when alone dwells securely, when they are, when they try to be accepted on those nation's terms, they will never be respected. Israel is respected by the world when only as the bearer of a moral message and mission. When that is rejected, Israel brings upon herself the contempt of the nations around her. Yeah. God has endowed various aspects of creation with distinct purposes and goals. The rejection of a national or personal mission is viewed in the most serious terms. Last paragraph will, will come more. Well, let's go through. Divine retribution is the means which God guarantees the ultimate purpose be attained. As was seen during widespread moral breakdown, the flood, generation of Bavel, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Last paragraph now, the next page. Just as this principle applies to the realm of general human society, so too is it valid vis-a-vis -vis the special mission of the Jewish people. Our divine election dating from the revelation at Sinai gave us the capacity and obligation to correct humanity, to teach and demonstrate to it the nature of human perfection, belief in one God, proper behavior. Isaiah described this, I have formed you with a unique nature and made a covenant with you that you will be or la'amin. Famously, a light unto the nations. As long as we continue to fulfill our national purpose, God will protect and reward us thereby helping us to fulfill that very purpose. Very chillingly, there was a one of the earlier reform Judaism conferences where they allowed intermarriage. And one of the Torah leaders at that time said, if we're going to allow it, then my fear is that the nations won't allow it. And about 100 years later, the Nuremberg laws were enacted where it was illegal for a Jew and a non-Jew to marry. If we don't make the Kiddush, the nations make the Havdalah. But that Havdalah, that separation that they make, is a divinely orchestrated strategy. That's not what they're thinking, but that's what the heavens is thinking. To make sure that we retain our distinct identity. Thirdly, as we see, we'll see some examples, but clearly the whole Tochacha speaks about the horrors that could come to the Jewish people if we have pervasive Jewish transgression, if we forget our mission, and that is done to us, those horrors, by the nations of the world. Our Ave wrote, our shirking our mission creates vulnerability as we see again masa avot simon lebanon that which happens to the avot is assigned to the children we will see that already going back to yaakov and asaph right yaakov represents the nation of israel as yisrael we are all b'nai yisrael Esav is Edom, the Western world, 
and often is used as an example of general anti-Semitism. This is taking place, Bereshit 28, 15, 32, 8. This is taking place when Yaakov is leaving the house of Lavan. And he's going to be encountering Asav. And the verses there state, Hashem had said to Yaakov, I'm with you. I will guard you wherever you will go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not desert you until I do that which I have said to you. Yet later on, as he's coming back now after the house of love, and Yaakov Ma'od, Yaakov is very frightened. Vayetzer lo, and is distressed. Vayachatzetaam, and he split his camp into two, and he said, if Asa will come and smite one, the other one will will be able to escape, and we will not all be destroyed. One second, what's going on? God guaranteed. God said, I'm with you. I will guard you. I will restore you. I will not forsake you. So why is Yaakov afraid? 21, the Maharal, the Gur Arya, who explains the Rashi. Why was Yaakov afraid? God had guaranteed that he would take care of him. The Gemara Metarets, the Gemara answers this. The Gemara in Brachot, the Gemara in Sanhedrin. What's the issue? This is why he was afraid. Shema Yigrom Hachet. Maybe he had sinned during these interim years. And as such, he will have lost this, this protection. And as such, he will now become vulnerable. Transgression makes us vulnerable. And that's why he was afraid now of this impending encounter with Esau, even though he had that promise from God. This too, we'll see in source 22, also explains. What happened with Amalek? Amalek attacked us right as we left Egypt at the, uh, at the pinnacle of our power, of our strength. And he asked, <clears throat> 22, How is it possible for Amalek to challenge the Jewish people at the height of their success? We learn this from the comment of the sage of the verse, Vayavo Amalek, Amalek came, Vayilachim in Yisrael, they fought with Israel, Birifidim, at a place called Rifidim. The location Rifidim is highlighted to teach the reason why Amalek attacked at that place. Rifuyim is rapui yedeim. Our hands became weakened. We weren't holding on tight. We weren't holding on strong. Because Israel weakened in their Torah study. One needs to understand what is the direct causality here. That a slackening in Torah would enable the Amalekites to attack the Jewish nation. The second paragraph. The explanation is that the Jews weakened Torah study indicated disrespect for Torah, leading to slackening. This disrespect flowed from a lack of appreciation of the tremendous importance of Torah and insufficient awareness of its holiness. The consequence, sluggishness, weakness, disinterest toward Torah. Therefore, the direct causality was that they were punished by the brazen of Amalek, who do not acknowledge at all the value of holiness, and whose entire aspiration and goal is to completely uproot and totally remove these values. That's what you want? That's who you're siding with? Look what happens there. 
if we are weak, then if we are weak in a spiritual sense, then we become vulnerable. The Torah stresses Amalek attacked. Where did Amalek attack? In Rifidim, in the place where Rafu Yedehem, our hands became weakened. Another example of this is the Purim story that we are all very familiar with. Famously, the Gemara asks the Talmidim, his disciples, asked Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, they asked their Rebbe, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Lama, why were the Jews of that generation on the verge of annihilation based on Haman and Achashverosh? Amr Lahem, he said to them, Imru Atem, classic teacher, trying to draw it out from the students. You tell me, what are your thoughts? Amr Lahem, they said, and they shenan numi sudatso shal Russia, because they enjoyed that a tremendous feast that Haman and Achashverosh had made, because they enjoyed that feast of Achashverosh. Right? We've explained previously that feast, during that feast, Achashverosh came out dancing, wearing the garments of the high priest, the cups they used, the kalim, shonim, the cups they used were vessels from the Beit HaMikdash. It was a celebration of the end of God's guarantee to the Jewish people that they would be redeemed, meaning we were now irredeemable. And therefore they could use all of these consecrated holy items with impunity. And the Jews enjoyed that su'uda. That was the reason that the students suggested to their Rebbe as to the answer to their own question, why was it? But he responded, if that's the case, the Jews in Shushan who went to the banquet should have been killed. But the decree was against the Jews throughout the empire, worldwide, basically, at that point. So the student said, Amorata, Rebbe, you tell us. Amr Lehem, he said to them, because she'ishtachavu latzelem, because they bowed down to an idol during the reign of the Buchanetzah, who destroyed the first temple. They bowed down to the idols there. So they said, if that's the case, why wasn't it fulfilled? Why were we on the verge of annihilation? Why were we saved? Why didn't it happen? And he explained the Jews only did it outwardly from fear of death, but without real inner conviction. Therefore, Hashem enabled Haman HaShverosh to frighten the Jews to repent. But Hashem never intended to allow that annihilation. And here we have a combination of two of our three factors. We have Haman, the descendant of Amalek, who detests God and the Jewish people and all that God and the Jewish people represent and stand for. But what enabled the door to be open to give him that opportunity? We bow down to the idol. It was our errors, our transgressions, our Ave wrote, our missteps. That is what opened up the door. Now, when we discuss, oh, I'm sorry, let me scroll down. There we go. When we discuss the destructions of the temple, right, we're now in the midst of the three weeks. It began this past Sunday and will end on July 18th, Tisha B'Av. We hope it'll, it will uh, end with rejoicing and not with mourning and with fasting and with Eicha. But these are the three weeks of the destruction of the temples. Now, at first glance, one might say anti-Semitism. But when one looks a little bit deeper, we say, no, this was the normal histor history of countries making their territorial conquest, their ambition, right, trying to take over. But then we have to look still deeper because we understand that this is a God-driven 
world. So we can't just say, oh, well, that's history, that's politics, that's war, that's conquest. But why did God allow that to overwhelm us and our temples? And again, Rav Maizelman. The third type of anti-Semitism is, is that exemplified by Babylonia and Rome, nations that were bent on world conquest and confronted the Jewish people among many nations they wanted to conquer. They weren't going just after us. They wanted to conquer as many nations as they could. On a level of simple historical understanding, this type of anti-Semitism does not require analysis. Their overt reasons are conquest, power, wealth, However, even here, the second paragraph, an explanation is required. For although on a level of simple historical explanation, Babylonia and Rome treated Israel as they would any other nation and cannot be classified as anti-Semitic, there are serious theological undertones to these conquests as well. The sages insisted. The sages would not say, oh, it's because they wanted the power. They wanted the conquest. They wanted the wealth. The question is always, why is God, who is orchestrating events in this world, why would he allow that to happen? There are serious theological undertones. The sages insisted that the real causation lay within Israel's misdeeds. And these nations' antagonisms to Israel's belief. The overt reasons of conquest, power, wealth are not adequate for understanding of Jewish history. Jewish history operates on a different plane. There is the God plane that needs to be incorporated. Babylonian Rome were bent on world conquest, Jewish history. Israel apparently occupied no special place in their plans. We are part of the world they wanted to rule, yet the verse says, why did God do this to the land? And proceeds to explain the conquest of the land of Israel by the Babylonians in terms of the failings of the Jewish people. The rabbi said the first temple was destroyed due to idolatry, murder, immorality. The second temple because of sinat chinam, causeless hatred. These outside forces, ostensibly the causes of destruction, are not listed at all. Our sages do not mention conquest, power, and wealth. They want to understand in a spiritual sense, why was there normal, natural, historical desires for these things? Why was that successful against the Jewish people? And for that, there needs to be a spiritual understanding. And for the first temple, it was the big three cardinal sins, idolatry, adultery, murder. But for the second temple, and that is the exile that we are sitting within today, that is sinat chinam, this baseless animosity, judgmentalism of one another, of seeing the faults, seeing what's lacking in one another, instead of seeing the greatness that each and every one of us has. And we see whenever, whatever the surface reason might be, we need to understand why is God using that? And as I mentioned, this is already going to the Bach, one of the classic commentators on Shulchan Aruch, on the code of Jewish law. And speaking about Hanukkah, he writes, This is during the time of the Second Temple. Why were the Greek Assyrians able to, to impose these laws on us? The decree was because we were lax in our service of Hashem in the Beit HaMikdash. So if you, what, does a, what does a good parent say? If, if a child's playing with something in a way that it's going to break, what does the parent say? If you're not going to be careful with it, 
then you can't play with it. If you don't appreciate the value of something, then it will be taken away. Once something is taken away, often that is when we appreciate it. When we have it, we can take it for granted. When it's taken away, then we appreciate what we had. Accordingly, the heavenly decree was to take that temple service away from them. And on that, Rav Volbi Zatzal, the great Mashkiach, points out, we have a whole new glimpse now, a whole new perspective, a whole new clarity. The decrees that come against us, even by the nations of the world, are not arbitrary. They don't come about without a heavenly spiritual reason. The decrees come in a measure for measure manner. Had there not been this weakening in our divine service, there would not have been these decrees made by the Greek Assyrians. So these are the three reasons that we see for it. It is hatred of God and the mission that we brought uh, and that which we represent. It is a means of keeping us in line making sure that we remain distinct and because of our weakness. Section four, our final section. Is there anything to do to eradicate anti-Semitism? Now, For thousands of years, our response to it was to bear the load, avoid confrontation. If nothing else would help, bribes were used. Or just ride the wave of hatred until it would pass. Also conversion was a way that we would, many, try to deal with it. Which, of course, hands the victory to the anti-Semites. And certainly, we saw in Nazi Germany, that was not even an, uh, that was not even, uh, an option. In more recent centuries, assimilation into Gentile society, without denying our Jewish identity, we thought that would terminate anti-Semitism. And we were very successful in assimilating in certain countries, Germany, France. And we know the result. Nazism, the Vichy government in France, we see the results. How about getting involved politically? Let's take a look at number 27. This again from Why the Jews, Prager and Telushkin. As all Jews must recognize, virtually all efforts to combat anti-Semitic outbreaks by means of political lobbying and general activism deal with the symptoms rather than the causes of Jew hatred. That's the Band-Aid. That's the symptom. Can we alleviate the symptoms? That is why no matter how effective these efforts, they cannot solve anti-Semitism. These efforts are important and effective, but only in a society relatively free of anti-Semitism. When a Jewish group publicly condemns some of anti-Semitism, that condemnation is effective only if the society has values that hold anti-Semitism contemptible. And unfortunately, we're seeing today in our world a mainstreaming of anti-Semitism, whereas any sort of any sort 
of racism is abhorred, but anti-Semitism is somewhat mainstream. Thus, the only solution to anti-Semitism is for, to, is for Jews to affect the values of non-Jews. All other attempts are doomed to failure, to failure, only buying time until the next eruption. So what do we do? So numbers two and three, we can sort of deal with. We can focus on being distinct, proud, gracious ambassadors of Judaism who do our very best to be good Jews. Number 28, they continue, Jews must therefore resume their original task, task of spreading ethical monotheism. The Jewish role is not to bring mankind to Judaism. As I explain, whenever people approach me about conversion, our role is not to bring mankind to Judaism. Those who want, we avail it. But that's not our role. The Jewish role is to bring mankind to universal moral law. It is the exquisite irony of Jewish history that this task, which has been the ultimate cause of anti-Semitism, must be fulfilled in order to end anti-Semitism. Because remember, cause number one is because we're bringing this, this morality, this monotheism. And that, they say, is the ex exquisite irony that by doing that which has been the ultimate cause of anti-Semitism, our teaching them morality, imposing this blemish on their souls of a conscience that must be fulfilled in order to end anti-Semitism. This means, in essence, the Jews must make the world aware of two basic principles. Ethics need God, and God's major demand is ethics. It needs to be that two-way street. The Jewish people in the tradition of ethical monotheism's greatest advocates, the Jewish prophets, must therefore oppose religionists of any religion who advocate God without depicting goodness as God's central concern. So a God without goodness, we reject. As we do goodness without God. Likewise, oppose secularists who advocate a value system devoid of religious and moral values. In the first case, God without morals, without good, God is morally irrelevant. Religion becomes a superstitious refuge for the moral demands of the world. In the second instance, morality, goodness without God, it's very relative rarely transcending personal taste. God without ethics has led to crusades, Gaddafi, 9-11, ISIS. That's God without goodness, God without morals. And goodness without God has led to the Gulag, Auschwitz. Right, that whole Soviet Union was all about equality for all of mankind. Right, we sing John Lennon's Imagine. But his Imagine led to the gulags. Everyone being the same, everyone has to be the same. And if you're not the same, the gulag, Auschwitz. That is morality without God. I've mentioned before, it always stings in my mind. A quote in Yad Vashem in Israel of one of the SS men who was working in the extermination camps. 
and saying how the challenge was getting home, spending time with his wife and children, and being a good a good daddy, a good husband. Because they were doing good work according to their view. Ridding the world of this lower level of humanity that they decided was a lower level of humanity and therefore should be murdered. Murdered in cold blood. That's when you have good without God. And God without good. You have ISIS burning villages, burning, uh, beheading people, killing people. That is our mission, what we need to be teaching. But we run into the problem. We run into the problem that we mentioned before. But they hate us for bringing that message. Vayikra. Let's see source number 29. If you study the Torah diligently, and follow my laws, and observe them, I will provide your rains in their time. The land will give its produce. The trees will yield its fruit. There will be peace in the land. You will lie down with no one to frighten you. I will remove wild beasts from the land. No army will pass through your land. I will turn towards you. I will make you fruitful and increase you. I will establish my covenant with you. On that, the Nitziv, Rav Berlin writes, included in the blessing that God will increase the Jewish people, is the proliferation of their wisdom, might, and all virtues. And the Torah states here that God will grant the Jewish people great success and stature beyond the nations of the world. The Jews will then strengthen their faith in God. The nations of the world will also recognize and know the divine kingship. As I mentioned before, that's how every single Aleinu Prayer at the end of every davening, we say Aleinu, and it always concludes, Vaya Hashem Lamelech Al Kol Ares. Hashem will be the king over all the land. Vayomahu Yashem Echad Ushmo Echad. And it happened once already. This was accomplished. This was fulfilled during an incredible time in Jewish history. And let's look at King Solomon. During the 40 years of Shlomo HaMelech's King Solomon's reign, source number 31. And Shlomo, I'll take it to save time, we'll take it in English. But these are the Psukim. These are Psukim in Kings, in the early prophets. Kings 1, and you have the sources right there. And Shlomo ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines, to the border of Egypt. They brought presents and served Shlomo all the days of his life, for he reigned over all the people beyond the Euphrates River, from Tifsach to Gaza, over all the kings beyond the Euphrates River. And he had peace in the lands on all sides around. Judah and Israel dwelt in security. Every man, Ish Tachat Gafno, famous quote, the Tachat Einato. Every man under his vine and his fig tree. Midan and Va'ad Be'er Sheva. From Dan until Be'er Sheva, all the days of Shlomo. And Hashem gave Shlomo wisdom, understanding, and breadth of heart as the sand that is upon the seashore. He was Chach Ve'echkamikol Adam, the wisest of all men. Bishma V'chol Goyim and his fame spread all around. And they came from all around to hear the wisdom of Shlomo emissaries of the kings who had heard about his wisdom. And Shlomo said, and now Hashem, God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. And the Lord, the word of Hashem came to Shlomo saying in the second paragraph, let me catch you guys up. There we are. Concerning this temple which you are building, if you will follow my statutes, fulfill my ordinances, observe my commandments to follow them, 
I will uphold, uphold my word with you, which I spoke to David, your father. Yisrael. I will dwell among the children of Israel, and I will not forsake at Ami Yisrael, my nation Israel. And on that, the Abarbanel explains why did Shlomo merit all these blessings? We learn from the life of Shlomo Melech that in God's compassion, he merited. He, Shlomo, merited many crowns. Crown of Torah, wisdom, grandeur, kingship, wealth, and honor. He, her, he earned all of this because he had a pure heart, meaning reverent in respect of God. Clean hands, honesty, integrity in his dealings with others. As it is written to Hillam, God bestows favor and glory. He withholds no goodness for those who go in purity, in innocence. The nations of the world recognized that God supervises, directs the world. They learned these lessons from Shlomo and accepted it. And what would happen? 33, then it's seen, as it says in the prophet Zechariah, in the future, the nation of the world, in addition to the Jewish people, of course, will travel to the Beit HaMethesh in Jerusalem during the intermediate days of Sukkot to be present when sacrifices are offered on their behalf. On Sukkot, we bring 70 sacrifices of one type, representing the 70 nations of the world. Meaning in addition to the Jews, they too will recognize that God rules the world and their material success, besides of course spiritual, but even their material success depends on the divine service that the Jews perform on their behalf. This was the practice of the nations during the reign of King Shlomo. Representatives from all the nations would come to Jerusalem during the festival of Sukkot, when Israel offered 70 offerings on behalf of those nations. King Solomon would teach them Kohelet, the book of Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities. That was the bad joke I said to Natalie when she wanted to replace the, the, the bathroom vanity. It's breaking. I said to her, Hevel Havalim, vanity of vanities. But we have to replace it, sorry. But Shlomo was teaching them this wisdom. And they were accepting it. They were in line with that. Actually, the Medrash... The sages say, had the nations understood the blessings that came to them via the service in the temple, instead of destroying it, they would have deployed their armies in a circle around it to make sure it would be fully protected. That was in the time of Shlomo. That's not what exists in our world today. But this will return. In the Messianic times, we go to the Navi, Isaiah, Yeshayahu, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. It'll happen at the end of days. The mountain of Hashem's temple, Mikdash, shall be firmly established as the head of the mountains. And all the nations, the Nahar is a river, they will stream toward it. Many nations will come, but when they'll say, come, Nale, let us ascend El Har Hashem to the mountain of God, El Beit Yaakov, to the house of the God of Jacob. And they will teach us God's ways. And we will go in their ways. And as a song, Ki Mitzion, Teitze Torah, Udvar Hashem Yerushalayim. Because out of Zion shall the Torah come forth. And the word of God will come from Jerusalem. And then he goes on and speaks about many of the uh, 
of the sukkah verse that we're familiar with, of the swords being beaten into plowshares. The United Nations has all of those sukkah, but left out the first pasuk. Kimitzion teitze Torah, that out from Zion comes Torah, and the word of God comes from Jerusalem. That is the time when it will be fully eradicated. The anti-Semitism will be fully eradicated. And as we mentioned before, the cause of the second destruction, the destruction of the second temple was that Sinat Chinam. And therefore, it follows a source number 35 from the Sfat Emet, one of the great Rebbe's of the Gera Hasidim. Kevan Sha'al Yidei Sinat Chinam Nechara. Since because of this baseless hatred and animosity, the temple was destroyed, Kol Shekain, then certainly, the English doesn't have the Kol Shekain, the certainly, but it's certain because Hashem's Mida of Tov far, far, far outweighs, we say, 500 to 1, any attribute of, of punishment. So if that is what led to the destruction, then Kol Shekain, certainly, Sha'ayidei Avat Yisrael, then through loving one another, seeing the positive, in one another, having a gracious eye to one another, it will be rebuilt Bezrat Hashem. Please God, with God's help. And what point I just want to add on what we said before, what Yaakov had told his, his sons before they went down to Egypt, Lama Titra'u, let us not be showy. So if we have blessings, enjoy our blessings. Thank God for our blessings. Share our blessings, but don't flaunt our blessings. Lastly, the Chavetz Chaim writes something that I think we can, um, we can really, really understand and connect to in our generations more than previous generations. Because Chaim writes as follows. We'll take it in English. After Yaakov and Mary lay in Rachel and raised his family in Haran and worked for love him for 20 years, right? Seven years to marry Rachel. Instead, he was given Leah. Seven days later, he was given Rachel in order that he would work another seven years. 14 years for the two wives and then another six years to try to accumulate his own, his own means, even which he did, even though Lavan kept switching the terms of the deal to try to swindle it all away from Yaakov. But after those 20 years, Hashem said to Yaakov, return to the land of your forefathers. When the nations speak against the Jewish people, falsely accuse us, oppress us, as in the context of, and Yaakov heard, the words of the sons of Lavan saying, Yaakov has stolen all of his wealth from us. And we hear that, right? Usurpers, we've stolen all the wealth. We restrain ourselves completely. We hear that we are insulted, but we do not respond. The Chavetz Chaim is talking about the 1900s, the 1910s, 20s. They go in their way and we go in our way. However, once we see that their faces are not what they had previously been, the Pazit said, Vayar Yaakov Pinei Lavan, Yaakov saw the face of Lavan and it was not as it was beforehand. Then it is a different situation. When the government leaders show us angry faces, then we are forced to find for ourselves a place of refuge. And that's when Hashem said to Yaakov, return, shuv el eretz avotecha, return to the land of your forefathers. The refuge most secure for us is the land of our forefathers, as it is written, shuv el eretz avotecha. And that is why, besides the central importance 
of Israel to the Jewish people, to, to our mission. But um, if things go wild over here or wherever, as we've seen a few years back when things were going wild in France, tremendous aliyah from France to Israel. The Iron Curtain lifted in the Soviet Union. Tremendous people, uh, amounts of people leaving, many to the States, many, many to Israel. The Arab countries, which used to have hundreds of thousands of Jews, things got wild over there, dangerous over there. We go to Israel. The Jews were in Poland, and I mentioned before, approximately 900 years. And it didn't last. The one place that we have, and that's why it's so important, another reason why it's so important that we keep it strong and we do everything that we can to support it. During World War II, all the countries, including the United States, were closing their doors. Some were letting in a trickle, some not even that. Chavetz Chaim says, remember what Yaakov was told, Shuv el Eretz Avotecha, return to the land of your fathers. So my friends, we need to, as we've been saying all along, we need to be proud, we need to be distinct, we need to represent that which we are. And the way that we uh, illuminate the world is not by proselytizing, by our behavior being upright, honest, exemplary, by our being distinct, and therefore we are ambassadors, and our being exemplary ambassadors of what it means to be a Jewish person, what it means to be part of this nation of God, not that others don't have a relationship with God, but we have a unique Taryag Mitzvah, 613 Mitzvah relationship with God. That's who and what we need to be and to do our best, to do our best and to, uh, and to bring that Nachat that that uh, happiness, that pride to our Shem from our actions. And with that, we hope to be able to bring back the days as they were in the time of Shlomo Melech, but even greater than that, as will be in the time of the Mashiach Tzidkenu, time of the Messiah, B'mheira B'amenu, may be speedily in our days. Amen. Okay, my friends, with that, um, all of these are posted on our YouTube channel. So if you've missed any, you want to catch up, this will be posted a little later this afternoon. It takes a little while for it to download and then upload. So there's some work that needs to be done with that. But um, feel free to access that. I will, uh, in tomorrow's email, I will include the link to our, our YouTube um, page. For all of these and some other classes, also the Tuesday morning classes are also posted, the Chumash classes. So, yeah, thank you all for joining. As I mentioned, there will not be lunch and learn the next two Thursdays. So we will resume on July 22nd. The sense that I've gotten from most is most people want to continue doing this over Zoom and not in person at least at this point, if you liked, right? If you do it in per I, I, I can't feed you lunch over, over, over the computer. Right? It, makes the, it makes the keyboard very, very messy. But, um, but we will uh, resume in person when we can, when we can start serving food again. And even when we do, I will do my very best to make sure that we're also streaming for those who are unable to, to attend in person and I'll get two sandwiches that day instead of one. Okay, everybody, be well. Join us tomorrow night, 6.15, Mincha, Kabbalat, Shabbat.
up until the last stanza of L'chad Dodi, when we accept Shabbos. So, of course, I need to power down immediately prior to that. Any questions? Anybody feel free. Sorry that I'm dominating. One of the nice things when we'll be back in person is that it could be a little bit more uh, interactive. But here, I'm talking to a bunch of boxes. But I do appreciate those who have lit up your cameras so I can at least see who's in the box. Okay, everybody. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Hey. We'll call it Thank over. you. Excellent Thank you, program, Rabbi. Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Ian. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for